Hi, my name is Bob Sadler. I hope at some point in the future they'll be able to present face to face. Uh, my talk today is focused on adaptive instructional benefits, challenges, and solutions. AI is uh, playing a large part in automating various steps in the adaptive instructional process to support intelligent tailoring of learning experiences. Uh, so I think it's very relevant to the AAAI community. Thank you to Dr. Lou for inviting me to talk. I hope uh, what I have to say will stimulate your ideas, enhance your understanding of adaptive instructional research, development, and also the marketplace. So thank you in advance for your attention. Here's the agenda that I put together for this uh, talk. Um, my goal here is to provide you with information, whether you're new to adaptive instructional systems or you're well aware of it, to um, be able to present to you and give you something that you can latch on to and take away from the talk. And uh, so the agenda is set up to hopefully do that. Um, we'll start off with an introduction. I'll talk a little bit about myself, my company, and my role in what's called the Adaptive Instructional System Consortium. Uh, I'll talk about adaptive, adaptable, and self-improving systems. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about adaptive instruction and what it is and how it's different from other uh, uh, less adaptive instruction. Uh, what adaptive instructional systems are, different categories of them, some a little bit about enabling and emerging technologies. Uh, next steps for the AIS community, where do we go from here? What are our, our needs? What uh, initiatives are we engaged in at this point? And then uh, where the AI community, uh, you know, triple AI and folks in this community where they can help. And there's some, some uh, interesting challenges. So uh, glad to be sharing those with you. And uh, hopefully this will meet your needs and uh, I hope it will. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, nearly 40 years in the learning sciences and technology field. 35 of those years have been with the U.S. Army and Navy uh, in their training science and technology areas. And uh, my doctorate is in modeling simulation from UCF with a focus in intelligent systems. Uh, as I noted before, I'm the director of learning sciences at SOAR Technology. Uh, I'm chairman of the board of the AIS Consortium, which is part of the IEEE uh, Industry Standards and Technology Organization. Um, I'm the father of GIFT, which is an adaptive instructional architecture I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, I'm the chair for the HCI Adaptive Instructional Systems uh, Conference. I'm the founding chair for IEEE Project 2247. And, uh, I used to teach a graduate course in intelligent tutoring system theory and design. As I noted in my introduction, uh, I'm the director of learning sciences at SOAR Technology. Uh, SOAR Tech is an AI company that conducts research for the US Department of Defense and was established in 1997 by Professor John Laird and other members of the AI lab at the University of Michigan. As I mentioned, I'm the chairman of the board for the uh, Adaptive Instructional Systems AIS Consortium, which is a nonprofit alliance under IEEE ISTO. Uh, we just formed in December 2020. Uh, we're a not-for-profit business association uh, who promotes the development and adoption of effective AIS solutions and uh, we're there to support industry and organizations that produce adaptive instructional systems, uh, components, features, et cetera, any kind of enabling technology. And uh, our members are industry and academic uh, organizations from North America uh, in Asia and the Pacific, uh, Europe, and also in the Middle East. So if you're interested in joining the consortium or just want to know a little bit more about it, feel free to email me at uh, bob 
Don Sondelaire at IEEE.org. Thank you. Okay, so as we uh, are getting into our discussion, one of the things I wanted to start off with is to talk about some differences and similarities between adaptable, adaptive, and self-improving systems. And so I think this is uh, worth a minute or so to uh, talk about. So adaptable systems are systems that are generally changed by their user. You know, there's uh, flexible control of information within the system. So an example of this might be your smartphone, right? You change what apps are on it, how it's configured, what it looks like uh, to meet your specific needs. Uh, it doesn't change itself, right? It's not an intelligent thing. Uh, so unlike uh, adaptable systems, adaptive systems do possess the intellect to change and act on their environment in response to changing sets of conditions. And, uh, and then finally, uh, you know, self-improving systems are adaptive systems that perform better with increased experience, right? So they're, they adapt themselves, but they learn over time uh, based on the weighting of their decisions uh, and to be able to uh, improve their policies over time. Okay, so it seems like uh, is now good, good a time as any to define what adaptive instruction is. Uh, it's any training or educational experience that's tailored to the attributes uh, that means the uh, capabilities, needs, interests, preferences, things like that of an individual learner or a team of learners with the goal of optimizing the efficiency and effectiveness of their learning experiences and being able to transfer the skills uh, that they develop in the training to operational or work environments. Uh, while we're focusing mainly on machine-based tutoring, uh, in this talk, uh, adaptive instruction is often uh, a technique that's used by expert human tutors and uh, key triggers for adaptations by machine-based tutors include modeling the understanding or learner competency, uh, understanding what the gaps in their learning are relative to learning objectives, their preferences and interests, and of course, you know, their, their overall learning goals. Uh, adaptive instruction has been widely applied and highly effective to support learning of cognitive tasks like problem solving and decision making, uh, where the measures of performance include accuracy, recall, and understanding of processes. Uh, it also has been applied to psychomotor tasks like physical kinds of tasks like marksmanship, uh, where measures of performance include like speed and stamina, accuracy, strength, agility, uh, precision, and uh, also for group tasks or team tasks, right, where people are have uh, different roles and responsibilities, and there's an interdependency of uh, action and interaction within that particular team. Okay, so. Uh... Let's talk a little bit about characteristics of good instruction. Uh, adaptive instruction is often touted as effective as uh, expert human tutors in delivering and managing instruction. Um, good instruction can be measured in three ways, uh, probably in more than three ways, but uh, these are the three that uh, I've chosen to focus on. Uh, individualization, which is a measure of efficiency uh, the instructor, whether it's human or computer-based, tailors the learning experience to fit the individual learner. Uh, immediacy, a measure of responsiveness, excuse me, in which uh, the instructor provides timely, relevant, and credible feedback. And then interactivity, which is a measure of engagement in which the instructor is actively engaged with the learner and the learner with the tutor. And uh, these three uh, characteristics, individualization, immediacy, and interactivity are, are terms that are often used by learners to describe their adaptive instructional experiences. So next I wanted to talk a little bit about influencers of effective instruction. Um, 
These are things that uh, have largely to do with the learner, but also with the system that's still delivering the instruction. Uh, they include learner memory, uh, the accuracy of modeling the learner in terms of their states and traits, right? So the system is uh, trying to adapt to that particular learner. So if it has an inaccurate model of the learner, it's the decisions that it makes are gonna be uh, less than optimal. Uh, and then uh, social and emotional skills of the learner, uh, their ability to uh, tough, tough it through some you know, confusing and frustrating uh, sessions where you know, their learning might be, not be going as quickly as they would like. Uh, and then uh, finally, you know, measures in the assessment of uh, the learner. So how accurate are the measures of what they've learned, right? And then what's left for them to learn. So I'd like to just take a moment to talk about the needs of you know, modern learners. Uh, there's always a discussion about uh, how differently modern learners have evolved. You know, I'm not so sure that uh, we're wired any differently uh, today than maybe learners 100 years ago. The environment, their knowledge of uh, you know, what their goals are, uh, how much time they have available for learning definitely makes a difference. And so, the system should be designed for speed and, and uh, engagement, shorter less lessons, micro learning, uh, things that are within the sphere of interest and within their goals. Uh, you know, visual as uh, media uh, in terms of, uh, you know, based on the prolif proliferation of, uh, you know, visual media that's uh, available to us today on the internet or through, you know, streaming services. So that is just what they're accustomed to looking at. Um, they need, we need to be able to curate uh, mobile compatible media. And so to be able to get that, uh, you know, get that uh, burst of micro learning uh, on their smartphone is uh, certainly an important uh, element uh, in making uh, uh, learning content available and accessible. Uh, and then finally, you know, social aspects of learning. Uh, today's learners tend to do things more in collaborative or project-oriented uh, teams. And so that's going to be important to be able to distribute and have that be interactive uh, and, uh, so that they can learn together. So we've talked a little bit about adaptive instruction, and as we're leading into talking about the technology of adaptive instructional systems, one of the things I wanted to mention was, you know, how do instructional systems today work and whether they're, you know, human to human tutoring or machine to human tutoring, uh, they work uh, in a similar way if they're not very adaptive, right? Um, most of the systems have a single learner. Uh, there's some instructional system that provides content uh, the learner acts on that uh, system, solves problems, uh, reads material, com completes actions assigned. And then, uh, you know, then the learner kind of observes, okay, this is what's going on in terms of my learning. There's some kind of feedback. Um, and the system interacts with the learner, assesses their performance, and then decides, okay, what problems to issue next. And so this is all, you know, uh, pretty standard in terms of uh, presentation of content. And all the adaptations are really based on the learner's performance. Uh, engagement is usually not a measure uh, of instructional effectiveness. And uh, generally learners with the same level of performance receive the same identical feedback and instruction. And so there's no tailoring. Uh, there's nothing to uh, you know, take into account the learner's interests or preferences or what they've learned previously. It's not modeled in most systems. So in the last slide, we indicated uh, how learners and instructional systems typically interact. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how adaptive instructional systems uh, interact. What are the adaptations that are, that are uh, in, the system provide to the learner and what kind of interventions, uh, whether that's feedback, et cetera. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how the system acts on the learner, 
um, how the learner acts on the instructional system and how it acts uh, to you know modify the instructional environment. Uh, and then a little bit about uh, how that feedback loop works and uh, self-improving systems and uh, you know how the adaptive instructional engine uh, gets uh, updated right so uh, in terms of acting on the learner so the instructional system provides some feedback maybe asks a question could prompt the learner for more information could prompt them to reflect uh, could ask you know could conduct an assessment at uh, some point and decide whether they're at expectations below expectations or above expectations um, so in terms of acting on the instructional system all right the environment in which the learner is interacting uh, the adaptive instructional engine could modify the challenge level that's the primary um, uh, focus of what the adaptive instructional engine is doing. It's trying to figure out, hey, is the level of difficulty in this problem space, uh, is that learner equal to that task? Do they have the capability to do this uh, or is it well beyond them or is it just too easy? And so it, as it observes the learner, it can make uh, decisions about what to do and modify the challenge level. And then it can also uh, select new content, right? So it could change content, move in a different direction uh, based on its assessment of the learner and the learner states. Uh, and then finally, uh, it acts on itself in that uh, it observes what happens with the learner after inter interventions happen, uh, whether that's feedback or support or direction, what have you and then decides whether or not that those uh, those interventions were useful to the learner in optimizing their learner learning and if it if it uh, observes that it is a good thing then uh, it'll maintain the policy that it used and if not then it may decide after a number of decisions to make a policy improvement Okay, so there are some advantages to adaptive instruction, uh, and they do contribute to good instruction, right? So uh, adaptive instruction provides personalized attention, customized pace, encouragement during one-to-one -one instruction. It adapts to each learner's abilities. It's equivalent to expert human instruction as measured by learning effect and learning efficiency. And so the ability to learn the same amount of material in a shorter amount of time or to accelerate your learning uh, is uh, an important feature or set of features uh, for adaptive instructional systems. Uh, adaptive instruction enables more efficient personalized learning by tailoring the learning paths of uh, any particular learner based on their prior knowledge and their competency. Uh, it provides more focused interventions that target gaps in each learner's knowledge, uh, individual's uh, knowledge and skill in comparison to the uh, individual's learning goals. Uh, the system uses adaptive instructional techniques uh, to, you know, to help develop the learner's metacognitive skills, resulting in better study habits, higher engagement, achievement. They, by reinforcing uh, metacognitive habits like uh, note-taking, reflection, or thinking aloud, uh, ask more questions. So successful students ask many more questions than unsuccessful students in one-to-one -one, uh, tutoring, uh, encourages students to ask many more questions. So we've spent a little bit of time uh, defining what adaptive instruction is compared and contrasted, adaptive uh, systems, adaptable systems, uh, self-improving systems. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, characteristics of what makes good instruction. We reviewed some advantages of adaptive instruction. And so I think we're at a point now where I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, what uh, processes are available for effective adaptive instruction. And this is one uh, process that uh, I'm sharing with you. There are many different kinds of processes and the way systems interact now. Um, and, uh, you know, the effectiveness of those, uh, you know, can be measured. So uh, 
For this one, this is uh, uh, more about uh, interaction between the learner and the, uh, and the system. And so I'll take you through the five steps here now. Uh, so the system interacts with the learner and updates the learner model as changes occur in the learner states. And those could be performance or emotions or engagement, anything that might uh, influence learning outcomes. And then uh, the next step, uh, the uh, instructional system selects some strategy or recommendations based on the learner states and you know, learning science principles about uh, how people learn. And there's a whole, there's a whole litany of uh, uh, literature uh, that can support that. And uh, different systems use different uh, learning science models. Um, and then in the step three, they select uh, instructional tactics or actions that are specific to that domain of instruction and uh, based on, again, learning science principles that are instantiated as policies. And they take into account what the context is, right? What the difficulty level uh, and the conditions are of the learner and the learning path. And then they repeat steps one through three until the learning goals are achieved for that course or lesson. And then they document the achievements for use in subsequent instructional experiences or in some kind of after action review. And uh, that is the five step process. OK, so after all that discussion about adaptive instruction, let's get into more specifics about what adaptive instructional systems are and how they deliver instruction. And uh, so adaptive instructional systems are kind of three things, right? They're a set of instructional methods, right? So uh, they deliver content in a specific way. Uh, think back to this just previous slide for the process for uh, effective adaptive instruction. Um, and then there are a set of technologies, obviously, right? Computer-based systems that guide learning experiences by tailoring instruction and recommendations based on the goals, needs, and preferences of each learner. And uh, and then finally, they're products, right? They're actually things that are sold in the marketplace or some enabling technologies or models or methods. And so uh, they are uh, using, they use AI and other advanced technologies to help people learn. Okay, so in a nutshell, AISs are artificially intelligent, they're computer-based, they guide learning experiences. They tailor instruction and recommendations. Um, they do this based on uh, their goals, the needs, uh, preferences, and interests of the learner, uh, whether it's an individual learner or a team. They do it in the context of whatever the domain or topic learning objectives are, are and how they're defined. And uh, hopefully they provide easy to use methods for authoring lessons and curating, searching, uh, finding, storing, tagging, and retrieving content. Okay, so there are some common elements that uh, are part of adaptive instructional systems. Uh, pretty much every adaptive instructional system has these four elements. They might label them slightly differently. Uh, learner model or student model, sometimes it's called, is a basis of tailoring. Um, instructional models, uh, these are strategies and policies that are used uh, in order to define learning science content and help the instruction, uh, you know, the instructional system make decisions about the learner and the content. Um, the domain model, it's about content, and content includes lots of things. It's not only about uh, the information that's presented to the student, it's also any questions that are asked and any strategies that are or rules that are associated with a particular domain, so learning principles that are associated with that particular domain. And then it's also the interface model. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, how the learner accesses uh, and interacts with the system and how adaptations are affected by the instructional model. So at this point, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, 
the learning effect model. And uh, this, the focus of this slide is to highlight what the process is for adaptive instruction and how it actually works with the learner. And so this is something that uh, a model that uh, I came up with in 2012 and it's been refined over time for both individuals and for teams. Um, Measures uh, are used to assess learner progress towards a set of defined objectives uh, using learner data, which includes information about uh, the learner's behaviors and their interactions. Uh, measures and machine learning classifiers are used to determine uh, learner performance and infer future performance. Um, accurate assessments of the learner's uh, states, which is, whether it's performance, emotions, engagement, are used to determine uh, what uh, interventions the AIS should uh, select. Um, these AIS interventions include feedback, support, guidance, direction uh, for the learner, and may also include changes to the learning environment, uh, the difficulty level, uh, in order to match that to the learner's current capability. Uh, there's this continuous monitoring that goes on uh, of the learner states to help model the effectiveness of the AIS interventions in terms of learning outcomes. Uh, these include learning, which is uh, knowledge and skill acquisition, performance, retention, uh, transfer of learning from the training or educational environment into some application, a work environment, and then effectiveness measures help improve the selection of future AIS, AIS interventions and reinforces the AIS's capabilities. And uh, this is the learning effect model. So there are lots of different adaptive instructional systems. Uh, so they're kind of bound into three different categories, one uh, which we call intelligent tutoring systems, and one that is a set of recommender systems, and then something that is a catch-all that's just called intelligent media. Uh, so intelligent tutoring systems uh, kind of you know, this kind of standard interaction that ha happens in training and educational environments. Um, they could be dialogue-based tutors, example tracing tutors, model tracing tutors, cognitive types of tutors, constraint-based tutors, lots of different kinds. And we'll talk about some, uh, some of the architectures in the next, uh, next few slides. Recommender systems are typically things you're familiar with, uh, like expert systems that have uh, kind of rigid decision trees uh, based on what your input is, depends on where you go in the tree. Um, and then you have something called intelligent mentors, which uh, assess the condition of the learner, what their goals are, et cetera, make recommendations about what to do next. And then, uh, like I said, intelligent media tend to cover things that are not covered in the other two categories. So those are categories of adaptive instructional systems. Uh, we talked a little bit about the effectiveness of adaptive instructional systems and adaptive instruction and regular instruction and how they differ. Uh, so I thought it would be good to look at salient characteristics of adaptive instructional systems. And this is adapted from a paper I did with Stephen Gilbert at uh, Iowa State uh, in 2011, 10 years ago now. And uh, the list uh, is pretty much the same. There's a couple of additions, but uh, basically uh, effective adaptive instructional systems are self-improving. Uh, they're adaptive, obviously, uh, that they tailor instruction to the needs of the, that particular learner uh, or team of learners. Uh, they're effective and credible, just like any uh, tutor. Um, they provide relevant information and they're able to support instruction in both ill-defined and well-defined environments um, you know, based on the learner's goals. Uh, they're accurate and valid, right? So they uh, use optimal instructional methods based on empirical results. Uh, they're usable, right? They're easy to use. They're accessible, uh, practical, and affordable, right? 
and uh, they're persistent in terms of modeling the needs of learners across lots of different uh, uh, instructional experiences uh, and cut across their careers or even their lifetimes. Uh, we talked about categories of adaptive instructional systems. I thought I'd touch on a few architectures. Uh, there's There are five that are listed here. I'm not going to read them out, but uh, basically uh, there are many, many more. Uh, some of them are very generalized uh, in terms of their application to many types of instructional domains or topical areas. Others are very narrow in terms of uh, what they do, but they have uh, very comprehensive authoring systems to develop content and to develop courses. And, uh, you know, and so they kind of run the gamut. And so let's talk about a few of them. So the first one, that uh, first uh, uh, adaptive instructional architecture that we're going to talk about is AutoTutor. You can find out more about it at www.autotutor.org. Uh, AutoTutor is a tutoring architecture used to develop intelligent tutoring systems that guide instruction through conversations with learners via natural language interaction. And so uh, AutoTutor has been applied to lots of uh, different cognitive domains uh, and produce learning gains across those domains that include uh, computer literacy, physics, critical thinking, et cetera. Uh, uses human-inspired tutoring strategies in terms of question asking and reflection. Uh, interacts with pedagogical agents to track and guide learning. Uh, so if you look at the bottom left, you see uh, two uh, uh, starry-eyed uh, uh, virtual characters. Uh, the female is the teacher, and the uh, male is the on the on the uh, right-hand side of the picture is a uh, a fellow student. And so as a learner. You have the option of interacting with not just the tutor, but also a fellow student. And uh, this has been highly, like I said, highly effective in multiple domains. In discussing auto tutor, I thought it would be useful for us to talk about what makes effective dialogue based instruction. And so just as there is a five step uh, uh, tutoring process. There is also a five-step tutorial framework that is focused on dialogue-based instruction and how to deliver that effectively. And so uh, we'll just hit the highlights of this. Uh, basically, step one, the tutor asks the learner a question. The learner answers the question. Uh, and then the answers evaluated by the tutor and then the tutor proceeds to answer uh, with some elaboration, right? So the, uh, the answer is elaborated primarily by the tutor, some extent by the learner to improve the quality of the answer the, to that particular question. And then finally, there's an assessment of the learner's understanding as they improve the answer over time and finally get to a level of uh, of uh, proficiency in terms of understanding the concept that's associated with that particular question. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the cognitive tutor. It's a tutoring architecture used to develop rule-based and example tracing intelligent tutoring systems. And so uh, the assessment of whether the learner's progressing towards the level of knowledge that's uh, required is determined by uh, some tracing of an example that is uh, you know, a process which the learner is supposed to be able to follow. And uh, focused on uh, cognitive tasks, mainly problem solving and decision making, produced uh, learning gains across multiple domains, computer programming, physics, chemistry, thermodynamics, etc. Been around for a very long time, very detailed. Uh, has made the transition to commercial product um, uh, through Carnegie Learning, uh, which is a commercial uh, company, uh, an offshoot of the uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, project that started as the Cognitive Tutor and now is uh, sold as a product called Mathia. 
M-A-T-H-I-A. Okay, so the last tutoring architecture that we're going to touch on is the Generalized Intelligent Framework for Tutoring, or GIFT. It's a free modular open source tutoring architecture, again, has produced learning gains across cognitive, psychomotor, and team instructional domains. Um, been applied to medical tasks, marksmanship, human anatomy, land navigation, or orienteering in the civilian world. Uh, it was developed by the US Army, uh, supports rapid authoring, reuse, and interoperability of tutors across the, uh, the instruction. Uh, instructional architecture, um, and uh, so it's been around not quite as long as Cognitive Tutor or uh, Auto Tutor, but uh, has been around now, uh, at least in its current form, for at least the last six or seven years. And uh, it's learning tools interoperability compliance, so it's been used to stimulate like edX courses. Uh, transparent to the user to be able to provide adaptations or recommendations about what that uh, particular learner should do next. And uh, so pretty comprehensive, has a set of authoring tools, has a, uh, a real-time instructional system, uh, uh, interactive model, uh, has a uh, evaluation, uh, you're able to uh, build experiments based on courses that you build and collect data and format and report that data. So a great research tool also. Uh, so I encourage you to check it out at uh, gifttutoring.org. Okay, at this point in the presentation, I thought it would be useful for me to talk a little bit about AIS enabling and emerging tech. I wanted to do that in the context of uh, how adaptive instructional system architectures work and uh, specifically you know thinking back to uh, you know auto tutor cognitive tutor and gift as instructional architectures and uh, you know how does uh, enabling and emerging tech support those architectures because not everything's a system sometimes it's a feature or a tool or a method and uh, so uh, there are enabling tech out there and emerging uh, tech. So uh, I want to do that in the context of uh, how you th might think about uh, the uh, instructional process as you're building it. If you're an instructional system designer uh, or course manager for an organization, you would plan the instruction, prepare the instruction, execute the instruction, and then evaluate the effectiveness of the instruction. And so I want to touch on tools uh, associated with those areas. And so we'll hit a few of those. In the planning phase for adaptive instruction, uh, an important piece is you know, knowledge management, right? being able to understand what learners uh, in a given field need to know, uh, the ability to model different learning paths to reach various levels of competency, the ability to define learning objectives tied to specific activities, uh, to grow knowledge and skill in that particular domain, uh, the ability to uh, identify measures of assessment to track learning and growth, the ability to manage data, uh, to model changes in learner competency, whether that's in real time or, cro or across uh, many learning experiences, a career or even a lifetime. Uh, and then finally, the ability for learners at all competencies levels to be able to publish their knowledge, right, and to share their knowledge so that, uh, again, we have some understanding of what the standards are in a particular area, what expectations are and uh, are able to manage that knowledge uh, and use that uh, in the future for building courses. Um, so I've got this kind of uh, red light, uh, red light, yellow light, green light uh, methodology. Uh, I would say at this point in time, uh, knowledge management tools related to adaptive instruction are probably yellow. Um, why there are many good knowledge management tools out there uh, lots of commercial uh, management tools. Uh, they're limited in their ability to automate processes. So the workload required to set them up and use them is relatively high, and that's why I have them as yellow. 
So in the uh, preparation phase of uh, adaptive instruction, what we're doing is uh, we're creating courses or authoring courses or lessons or scenarios. And then uh, we're also curating content, right? So we're out there searching for content, maybe developing some content, tagging that content, et cetera, and then storing it for later use. And uh, so authoring tools are, again, used to help define objectives and assessment methods, uh, to develop adaptive scenarios, courses or lessons, to integrate external systems, right? So it might be that uh, you have a simulation that's not uh, highly adaptive, but you want to drive that with an adaptive instructional system. And this has been done many times before, and especially in game-based environments, uh, the, to get the engagement of uh, a, a game and the usefulness and, and the rigor of an adaptive instructional system. Um, and content, uh, you know, content curation, again, you're constantly kind of surging for, uh, for content, tagging that content, storing it and retrieving it. Um, and again, I'd use the red, yellow, green. I, again, I've had this category yellow. Um, uh, one reason is authoring tools are not always part of a given adaptive instructional system architecture. Uh, they, so, or if there are authoring tools, they're not uh, very user friendly. Um, commercial content curation tools abound, uh, lots of them that are focused primarily on social media and marketing and uh, may not be as effective for selecting content for use in adaptive instructional experiences. So in the execution of uh, adaptive instruction, uh, this is the real-time interaction between the learner and the system. Um, it's uh, important to make sure that uh, you're adapting the learning experience difficulty to closely match the capabilities of the learner. This is a theory that was developed by somebody called Vygotsky, uh, and it's called the zone of proximal development. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, Real-time assessment is important. Again, uh, this interaction needs to be if it's a dialogue-based tutor or if there's uh, some training interaction, this real-time piece is uh, really important so as not to uh, you know, disconnect or interrupt the flow of that particular learn learner and their learning experience. Um, relatively accurate uh, you know, assessments uh, given there's enough data, so that's kind of where the technology is. Um, still need unobtrusive methods to accurately assess things like emotion. Um, there's been lots of experimental uh, methods that have been used to wire people up and, uh, uh, and assess them. Uh, so being able to do that with some you know, unobtrusive, low-cost sensors like webcams, etc., cetera, uh, is useful uh, in maintaining the accuracy of those methods uh, as the learner moves around, uh, specifically for like psychomotor tasks. That's important. And uh, and then this idea of real-time optimization, uh, you know, insufficient data from across learning experiences to generalize methods that optimize uh, instructional interventions. And so um, this idea of building competency models and maintaining those models across different uh, inst instructional uh, experiences uh, is important because, again, most people are using multiple systems and not just using a single architecture. And so there's uh, quite a bit of research and development going on to develop standards uh, to be able to do that real-time optimization. So I had mentioned the zone of proximal development and being able to connect the difficulty level of the problem or scenario or uh, learning experience uh, to the learner's capability. If there's too big of a disconnect, then this creates uh, some emotional um, uh, changes. Uh, if you have a high level of challenge and a low level of competence in terms of the learner, uh, the learner becomes very anxious. 
Uh, if it's too easy and they have a high level of competence and the challenge level is low, uh, they become bored and disconnect. And so this monitoring and managing this interaction with the, between the learner and the adaptive instructional system is an important element of the, uh, the architecture. So, and finally, I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, evaluating AIS's. Uh, I could have uh, rated this as a red light, but I thought since there are a number of initiatives that are going on now, it would be uh, worth putting it as a yellow and then uh, kind of taking you through what's going on. There are a number of IEEE standards that uh, are related to adaptive instructional systems. There are two active uh, uh, groups that are going on under the Learning Technologies Standards Committee. Uh, one is 2247, which is specifically adaptive instructional systems, uh, concept models, interoperability, evaluation methods, uh, protection of data, ethical use, etc. And uh, another one is 9274. That project is focused on using uh, the, the experience application uh, program interface, AP, XAPI. Uh, those are achievement statements that are generated by uh, adaptive instructional systems and uh, used uh, by uh, competency modeling systems uh, in order to assess uh, you know, learning over longer periods of time than a single lesson or session. And then uh, lots of activity going on uh, within the AIS consortium. But uh, one thing worth noting is there will be some evaluation certification services that will be developing over the next year or so uh, that will match up with the IEEE standards that uh, are evolving at this point. And so this will be one way to you know, certify some minimum uh, interoperability uh, or effectiveness uh, of your of a particular system, and uh, that'll give consumers uh, you know pretty good warm and fuzzy about where those systems are going. Um, there are a number of uh, competency modeling tools that are out there. They're pretty limited at this point, uh, but uh, you know evolving. Uh, credentialing tools also growing. There's a number of services that are out there that are uh, supporting different uh, different states, counties, and uh, and federal services. And um, and then self-improving system architectures. I'd have to say those at this point are very limited. And I think as we see more implementations, uh, then that will help us uh, in terms of where you know where we need to go, what standards need to evolve, and uh, and uh, you know what is you know, what are recommended practices for self-improving system architectures. So let's talk a little bit about next steps. Uh, as I mentioned, the AIS consortium uh, very active. Uh, we have a resource repository that's. Uh, uh, going to start up here soon. It's uh, going to be focused uh, on open source, at least initially, with some um, reference implementations that will be available to members uh, as those are built out. But the actual uh, projects that are migrated to the repository uh, in 2021 will include GIFT. Uh, so GIFT will be uh, available and you will be able to not only use it, but actually modify it and use it to build other products. That has been limited to this point, but now it's a truly open architecture. Um, competency and skills system will also be migrating. So this is a competency modeling and credentialing uh, process. And uh, so that will get us started and uh, hopefully the uh, the people who are using the system will be able to contribute back to it and improve it. Um, Guru uh, Navigator is another project. Uh, this is an open source visualization uh, to support open learner modeling. So uh, you know, learners can actually see how they're progressing and uh, take a little bit more initiative in their learning. and. Uh, so that will be part of it. And then the repository will be LearnSphere compliant. 
Uh, that's important. Uh, this is a way of uh, storing and sharing learner and system data. Uh, it's going to be important for the AIS consortium and for really for the AIS community as a whole. Um, we will have some, as I mentioned, some reference implementation projects that will happen uh, later this year and in 2022. And so an example would be some exemplar courses in you know, cognitive psychomotor and uh, collaborative learning domains that are GIFT compliant. So that is uh, what we have going on in terms of next steps in the community. Okay, so reaching out to the uh, AI community as a whole, uh, here's where the community can help in terms of uh, developing tools uh, and uh, pushing the state of uh, the art forward and moving things from the state of the art into a state of practice. And uh, so the thing that's on the top of my list is, uh, you know, grassroots knowledge sharing tools. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a number of commercial tools. Uh, it'd be nice to have something that was particularly focused on adaptive instruction uh, and the processes that we use. And so that uh, people who are knowledgeable in the AIS community can, uh, can share their knowledge. Uh, the next thing is uh, AI guided authoring processes and uh, authoring tools at this point uh, tend to be difficult to use. It's sometimes hard to follow where you are in the process. Um, you know, GIFT has some uh, really nice drag and drop tools. Uh, they're super great, but uh, there's really not any kind of uh, che even checklist, uh, although there is a validation when you get ready to go publish your course, whether or not you have all the information in order to be able to do the assessments that you laid out uh, in, in support of learning objectives. Uh, so something that was AI guided that would uh, remind you or guide you through the process to make sure that uh, the process is complete rather than just at the end when you go to validate here that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Um, enhanced authoring process automation to reduce workload. These systems are, uh, you know, multidisciplinary uh, kinds of uh, efforts, uh, you know, with instructional designers and computer programmers and psychologists and, uh, you know, and, and learning scientists, et cetera. And so it's, um, you know, sometimes difficult to build these systems without, uh, you know, a whole lot of knowledge. And, um, you know, so if you happen to be a subject matter expert, somebody who knows about a particular domain, um, the goal uh, for these systems is for you to be able to build the system without any knowledge of computer programming. And uh, so we'd like to see enhanced authoring process automation to reduce the workload and, uh, you know, kind of ferret out some of the tedium that's associated with building these systems. Uh, areas that uh, can be useful are automated scenario generation so that uh, you can have lots of different but equivalent kinds of scenarios that can support learning in a particular domain. Uh, and then automated, automated hierarchical text mapping to domain topics so to be able to define learning pathways. Lots of texts that are out there, right, in terms of books. Um, you know, or even if they're electronic books, is to be able to take those things and to add, you know, automatically map those into topical areas and plot out uh, paths from very novice learners to very uh, expert learners. And uh, next thing on the list is uh, more robust content curation for learning experiences is uh, to help uh, with automating those processes, maybe auto tagging, metadata tagging uh, would be uh, useful. And then uh, more robust low data uh, methods to support things like uh, learner classifications, assessments, uh, bootstrapping of goal-based policies. Hey, oh, hey, how do you start out you know, when you're authoring new policies? And how do you know what's most effective? Um, and you don't want learners on the front end to get, uh, you know, to be denigrated by poor policies, right? So uh, how, how, you know, how is it possible to bootstrap some of those goal-based policies? 
uh, optimizing AIS interventions, right? And so this idea of, hey, I understand what's going on with that learner. What's the best thing that I can do for them? And uh, I would say that uh, it's, you know, that's not crystal clear yet. And then um, more robust, unobtrusive assessment of emotional states. So emotions uh, really play a large role in, uh, in adaptive instruction and in learning processes. And so being able to track those things, but do that in a way that doesn't interrupt flow uh, or influence uh, or create frustration, frankly, for the user. And uh, so that's what we have and what we're asking for from the AI community. Okay, so uh, we're at the end of, uh, of our talk and uh, I really appreciate the attention. I know it might be difficult given the, uh, you know, the dispersed, uh, uh, distributed uh, nature of the talk and the fact that uh, I'm not there during, you know, during, the, uh, during the replay. Uh, but I hope this will at least have given you a, an introduction to some of the challenges, uh, some of the needs uh, for adaptive instruction, adaptive instructional systems and their architectures. So thank you very much for your attention.